Okay, filling in for John today, and I, me I mentioned to you the last couple times I've done this that I decided that what I would do when I had to fill in for John is take a book and go through it, and I chose the book of Proverbs. I've introduced the book. We've looked at chapter one. We're going to look at chapter two today. I called chapter uh, two, Paths to Follow. Paths to Follow. And whereas in chapter one, there is great uh, emphasis on um, hearing the voice of parental instruction, not hearing the voice of evil men, hearing the voice of wisdom, uh, the results of refusing to hear the voice of God. In this chapter, there's a great emphasis on the paths in life uh, that you are to follow. When you talk about the word path, you're talking about a course of action. Wisdom is a path to walk. And if you look closely in this chapter, you'll see that the word path occurs seven times in this chapter. If you like to underline in your Bible, you might underline those. Path occurs seven times, and then also the word way. The word way occurs five times in the chapter. So path, seven times, way, five times. And these words suggest to us that life involves direction, uh, decision, and determination, just like walking uh, a path. The path of wisdom is a guarded path, verse 8. A good path, verse 9 that leads to life, verse 19, and righteousness, verse 20. On the other hand, the path of folly is dark, verse 13, devious, verse 15, and leads to death, verse 18. So in our study from Proverbs 2, we want to see the path to walk, and that path, of course, is the path of wisdom. How many verses in this chapter? 22. And we'll attempt to notice all of them in our class today. So first of all, the search for the path of wisdom, verses 1 through 5. The source of the path of wisdom, 6 through 9. And then the security of the path of wisdom, 10 through 22. The search for the path of wisdom, first five verses. Verse one, my son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Now, this chapter in Proverbs, like so many others, opens with what two words? my son. The son that's under consideration here may have been Rehoboam. But the important thing to notice is sound advice is being offered. And throughout this chapter, Solomon tries to impress his son with the necessity of following the path of wisdom in his life. And the word if underlines the element of choice in the process of finding wisdom. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. If. Well, that shows us we are a people of choice, aren't we? Did God create puppets or people? People. People. People with freedom of choice. We have to choose the path of wisdom. We've got to make an active, determined effort to follow the path of wisdom. And he lays down the conditions and the terms whereby you can find that for which you're searching. And there's a progression and emphasis 
in these verses. So that thou incline thine heart unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. The ears to be inclined to wisdom. Just like a ball will roll down an incline, so if you are inclined toward wisdom, you're leaning into it, you're letting it enter the head through the ear where it can find the ultimate destination of the heart. Verse 3, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So here he's urged to cry after knowledge. You know, in 1 Peter 2, 2, Peter says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Have you ever watched a baby as his mother is fixing his bottle? He's he's wiggling hands, mouth, feet in anticipation. He desires the milk in his bottle. And the child of God ought to be that way about the milk of the word of God. There ought to be a cry for knowledge. And when you have that kind of, of desire, you, you have people taking notes, writing in their Bibles, bringing their personal Bibles to class. There's a, there's a crying for knowledge. There's a desire uh, for that. And remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? So there needs to be a voice that's willing to say, please help me understand that. What kind of attitude did the, the eunuch from Ethiopia have? He was seeking, wasn't he? And, and when Philip said, understandest thou what thou readest, what did he say? He wanted somebody to help him, didn't he? There was a cry there for knowledge, right? He's studying Isaiah 53, he doesn't understand it. There's a, there's a desire, there's a thirst for knowledge. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searcheth for her as for hid treasures. Now in the uh, in the desert of California, there are quite a few silver mines. I'm sure you've heard of Death Valley. Uh, Death Valley is the lowest, hottest, driest area of the United States. Sometimes temperatures get over 120 degrees in Death Valley. In 1849, there was a party of immigrants who lost their way in the valley and after intense suffering, they made their way out by climbing the mountains, which were very steep, to the west the next year in 1850. And one of them gave it its name, Death Valley, because it's, it's just such a desolate desert environment. Well, in the 1870s, you had gold and silver and borax and copper and lead all discovered in Death Valley. All these minerals, all these ores, and so then you had mining towns spring up in this terrible environment 
where nobody ought to be. And, uh, and many a person died in Death Valley trying to get out the ore, the silver, the gold, the borax, the minerals there. And they made all kinds of, of sacrifices and they pulled out with 20 mule team wagons trying to get that stuff out of Death Valley. Well, they went through a lot to get it out, but that's the way we ought to go after the knowledge of the word of God. If thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. If these conditions are met, then the wonderful promise of verse 5 will apply. Then you'll understand the fear of the Lord. Then you'll find the knowledge of God. One woman came to Brother Gus Nichols after one of his sermons and she said, I would give the world to know as much about the Bible as you do. And he said, that's exactly what it costs. And if you pay that price, then you can know as much as I do. Now we see the source of the path of wisdom in verses 6 through 9. And I really like verse 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He points out the source of wisdom is whom? It's the Lord. The Lord giveth wisdom. He didn't want his son to go to the world for wisdom or some other insufficient source trying to find wisdom. Go the one that's all wise for wisdom. He knew God could give wisdom. That's James 1 5, is it? If any man asks for wisdom, let him ask God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. We're to pray for wisdom. God gives us wisdom. God is the source of wisdom. But notice what it says. For the Lord God giveth wisdom out of his what? Out of his mouth come a knowledge and understanding. That suggests to us that God gives wisdom through his word. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. So he's impressing on his son the need for wisdom and the need to go to the right source. In Daniel 2 and 21, Daniel said, He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. And that's what he did with Solomon. He giveth wisdom to the wise. What did Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom, didn't he? Was that a wise request? And that's why God blessed it, right? He giveth wisdom unto the wise. That was a wise request. So God gave him even more wisdom and much more than he even asked for. God is the only source of wisdom. He layeth up sound wisdom. And that Hebrew word refers to stability. He's telling us only those that find God's wisdom can have stability in life. And the object of wisdom is to protect us from instability and uh, the onslaughts of life. Now, you remember, look over in Matthew 7, uh, 24 through 27. 
You remember how the Lord ends the Sermon on the Mount? He really ends it talking about stability. Because he tells the, the parable of the two builders, right? And we sing vacation Bible school about it, don't we? The wise man builds his house where? On the rock, which is symbolic of God's word. The wise man builds his house on the rock. And then the winds came, and the rains came, and the floods came. And what happens? It stood. All is well. But the foolish man didn't do that. And what happened to his house? It fell. And great was the fall of it. So here are the rewards of seeking after God's wisdom. He says God is a buckler to those that walk uprightly. And this reminds me of God's statement to Abraham in Genesis 15.1. After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield. That's what a buckler is. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham sees that promise and used that shield. And generations unborn would be blessed as a result of his faith. All right, Proverbs 2.8. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yea, every good path. And the message is if we depend on God, if we seek for wisdom, if we follow the path of wisdom, then righteousness, judgment, and equity will be ours. And more than that, will be Preserved. Turn over to First Samuel eighteen. First Samuel eighteen. Beginning at verse five. David was preserved from Saul. For many years, because he walked in God's path of wisdom. In 1 Samuel 18, 5, David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and what's those next three words? Behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, also in the sight of Saul's servants. The Bible says David behaved wisely. That word is translated from a Hebrew word which means to prosper. The Hebrew word is sakal. If I was to spell it in English, it would be S-A-K-A-L. Sakal. He was a sakal man. In fact, this word occurs four times in this chapter. Look at verse 14. And David behaved himself, so called, wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Then verse 15. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. And then verse 30. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely that all the servants of Saul so that his name was much said by. So call wisely. Now I want to notice two things back in Proverbs. Let's go back to Proverbs now. But I want you to turn over to Proverbs 10, 19. I want to notice two insightful things about this word so call. Behave wisely. Proverbs 10, 19, in the multitude of words, 
there wanteth not sin. But he that refraineth his lips is wise, so called. Person who is wise and prosperous knows when to keep his mouth shut. He can keep confidences when people say that's confidential or, or just between us. And then look at Proverbs 21 11. Here's another characteristic of a Sakal man. When he does open his mouth, he opens it with discretion. Proverbs 21 11. When the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise. When the wise is instructed, so call, he receiveth knowledge. So here the wise person is teachable. And that's the kind of person that David was. He was wise because he guarded his lips. What he said. And also he kept a teachable spirit. So David was doing what he needed to do and being what he needed to be. And the story of David during his uh, fugitive years uh, illustrates the path of wisdom in, in the dangerous situations of life. All right, now thirdly, we have the security of the path of wisdom. This is verses 10 through 22. In Proverbs 2 and verses 10 and 11, when wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. The path of wisdom provides security and safety to those that possess it and follow it. And notice out that he, he points out that preservation and, and safekeeping comes from the wisdom that God gives. When wisdom enters the heart, when knowledge is pleasant to the soul, then you won't be deceived as easily. You're not going to be taken in if you stay close to the word of God, if you stay on the path of wisdom. You'll have your eyes open. Discretion means making decisions with care, keeping your eyes open. If we have discretion, we'll weigh what we're doing, weigh where we're going. Verse 12, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they forward in their paths. Solomon points out that following the path of wisdom provides deliverance from the way of the evil man. And he points out the evil man was once on the path of uprightness. But in the course of time, he leaves it to walk in the ways of darkness. He rejoiced to do evil. And they speak forward things. That's perverse speech. Profanity, vulgarity, irreverence. They walk in the ways of darkness. Ignorance. Uh, error. Look over in Romans 13, 12 through 14. And look at how Paul uses that metaphor. Romans 13, 12 through 14. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh 
to fulfill the lust thereof. Here is this cast off the works of darkness. Walk in the day and not in the night. Rejoice to do evil. Delight in the frowardness of the wicked whose ways are crooked. They forward in their paths. You know, Absalom, David's son Absalom. Absalom was rebellious, but he did not stoop to the terrible um, acts of public wickedness till David's old advisor, Ahithophel, counseled him and he began to listen to him. You remember it was Ahithophel that counseled uh, Absalom to go out and commit adultery on the roof of the royal palace with ten of David's concubines. And it was Ahithophel who urged an immediate campaign to go after David and to kill him. His, His counsel was clever but wicked. And if if Absalom had possessed true wisdom, he never would have listened to Ahithophel in the first place. But Absalom showed a lack of understanding. In, uh, In verse 14, you have an amazing trait of evil men that's given. They rejoice to do evil. In Romans 1.32, Paul says, In knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Rejoice to do evil. And you remember the great love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 6. It said of agape love, Rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoiceth in the truth. So wisdom keeps us from associating with those people that rejoice in evil. It helps us to rejoice not in iniquity. It says whose ways are crooked and they forward in their past. Why don't we speak of dishonest people as, as crooked? We do, don't we? He's crooked. Or he's a crook. That comes from that, doesn't it? He's crooked. The path of the evil man is crooked. Well, what's God's way? Straight. Narrow. It leads to life. Hebrews 12, 13 says, Make straight paths. For your feet. Verse 16 to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the God of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. None that go into her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. Wisdom provides deliverance from the Strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Um, I probably don't have time to look at it, but do you remember Delilah? Didn't she use flattery? Delilah and uh, with her flattery and with her persistence, she was able to discover what? Secret of his strength. Secret of Samson's strength. She was the strange woman, wasn't she? He describes her way as a path of broken covenants. Which for sake of the God of her youth, forgetteth the covenant of her God. Her house inclineth unto death. She broke the covenant she made with the God or friend of her youth. Most people believe that to be her husband. 
She forgot her covenant with God. She lives a life of immorality. So I think about, and certainly Solomon fits this too, but I think about Samson and Delilah here. Verse 20, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. So as the chapter closes, we're reminded of the security that comes with walking the path of God's wisdom. For the upright shall dwell in the land. That, that is, uh, in the Old Testament, the reward of obedience to God. Leviticus 25, 18. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. But now God would warn them, if you sin against me, Apostasy is going to result in the loss of the land. You're not going to dwell in the land. And then when they persisted in sin, what did God do? He punished them by carrying them off the land into captivity, didn't he? And he warned them he would do that. So you have Assyrian captivity and you have Babylonian captivity. Verse 22 pictures uh, like a, a blighted tree cut down, rooted up, carried away to a place where it can do no more harm. You got the tree cut down, then you got the root system dug up. It's a whole lot easier to cut down a tree than to get rid of all the roots, you know that? Really hard to get rid of all the roots. We had a tree like that in our backyard at home. It had roots all over the place. We were constantly running over them with the lawnmower. You know, that's not good for the blade. You know, huge roots all over the backyard. This proverb here is like a history of Israel, because they would find themselves in in idolatry. And false prophets and ungodly kings and ungodly priests would support the root system of idolatry and the, the tree grew and it, it flourished, poisoned generation after generation. And then God cut the nation down and the Babylonians and the Syrians invaded, carried them off into captivity and that, that rooting out process took a while. 70 years at least. And then you have people start coming back to the land and dwelling in the land. And did they still sin? Yes. Still have problems? Yes. What about idolatry? It wasn't the problem it had been before. It sort of burned out idolatry like they had done before. It had been rooted out by the captivity. So the point's being made here that those that refuse the path of wisdom and life, you're going to meet a terrible end. And sadly, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, failed to seek wisdom like his father encouraged in this chapter. And we don't need to make that mistake. All right, thank you very much. Enjoyed studying Proverbs 2 with you today.